Well, thank you, Alex, for your thoughtful and at times moving opening statement. I appreciate it very much. Now, Alex has raised two lines of, um, or essentially two lines of argument um, against the existence of God, so divine hiddenness and the problem of evil. So I'll begin my rebuttal first with a discussion of divine hiddenness. So my view on divine hiddenness is that I trust the goodness of God. I think that there's very powerful evidence to think Christianity is true. And so I trust God's goodness as revealed in scripture. Um, and God presumably in his omniscience knows what every person would have done had they had more evidence, i.e. whether they would have chosen to enter into a relationship with God or to reject him. We know from plenty of biblical examples that not everyone who is presented with sufficient evidence for God, whether by miracles, uh, predictive prophecies, direct manifestations, etc., submit to him. If God knows that a given individual is not going to enter into a good, lasting relationship with him, then why would God ensure the person believes? Furthermore, scripture also indicates that people are judged in accordance with the amount of light that they have rejected. Uh, even many contemporary public atheists have essentially said that no amount of evidence could change their mind. For example, Richard Dawkins was asked in conversation with Peter Bregosian that it would, what it would take for him to believe in God, and Dawkins said that not even the second coming would be enough evidence. When Bregosian asked him whether any amount of evidence could change his mind, he replied, well, I'm starting to think nothing would, which in a way goes against the grain because I've always paid lip service to the view that a scientist should change his mind when evidence is forthcoming. It could therefore be seen as an act of mercy for God to withhold from them more evidence if they were going to reject it anyway, and thereby bring upon themselves greater judgment. This adds yet further plausible motivation for God not to ensure that everyone had greater access to evidence for his existence, which would thereby render them more culpable. This point has been uh, independently made by Travis Dumps uh, Dumsday in a paper in the Journal of Religious Studies. Uh, this last point may be challenged by the skeptic by pointing to the existence of non-resistant non-believers, as Alex, of course, did. Now, he mentioned John Schillenberg, who's the champion uh, advocate of this argument from non-resistant non-believers. And he says, and I'm quoting, If there exists a God who is always open to a personal relationship with any finite person, then no finite person is ever non-resistantly in a state of non-belief in relation to the proposition that God exists. Uh, end quote. But I would question whether there is such a thing as long-term non-resistant non-belief. So my own view is that um, the evidence for Christianity is such that anyone who is fully informed and takes it upon himself to impartially examine uh, the evidence with a heart open toward accepting God as Lord will, in the long run, come to find Christianity to be true and well-supported. In any case, human psychology, particularly at the subconscious level, is so complex that I doubt it is um, demonstrable that any non-believer is completely non-resistant throughout the course of their lives. A related objection is that it's possible for the evidence for Christianity to have been stronger than it in fact is. Um, surely if God existed, he would have given us the strongest possible evidence. But I don't think that we need to expect something that goes beyond perfectly adequate evidence for the serious inquirer. Many atheists are under the mistaken impression that God wants people to believe in him, no matter what they are going to do, uh, uh, go on and do with that, with that knowledge. It's uh, never contended anywhere in scripture that it's a commendable thing to believe in God, yet reject a relationship with him. In the Old Testament, the Jews had no doubt that God existed. They had even seen many miracles performed before their very eyes, and yet they went off time and again into idolatry. Even those who saw Jesus' miracles before their very eyes uh, didn't believe in him. Uh, such as in um, John 12, 37, for instance. Uh, and they wanted to put him to death. Uh, for example, see the um, reaction of many after Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Now, the 18th, 18th century lawyer and Christian thinker, Joseph Butler, um, another hero of mine, in his analogy of religion, uh, put forward the idea that our time on earth is a period of probation. For some people in particular, the form that that probation may take is a form of testing whether they are willing to engage in the intellectual inquiry that is necessary to give themselves a fair examination of the evidence. An objection I sometimes encounter is that God, if God existed, then there sh um, should be, um, not be any uh, reasonable arguments against his existence at all. Um, but this complaint, it seems to me, boils down essentially to the dubious claim that if Christianity is true, there cannot be any puzzles that require mental effort to work out or to decipher. Uh, another point to bear in mind is that many people are not even presented with these as puzzles that seriously compromise the evidence that they already have. For some people, working through the problem of evil is part of their probation here in this life. And if they are diligent, they will work through that problem. 
Uh, even if they cannot find adequate and satisfying answers to why there exists so much suffering in the world, they can learn to trust in the goodness of God and find in the problem of evil insufficient ground to overturn the avalanche of positive confirmatory uh, evidence for biblical theism. Either they will find adequate answers or they will find enough positive evidence to make the fact of their inability to find those answers not, in the end, sufficient to undermine their faith. I often hear the objection that in order uh, to really be compelled by the evidence for Christianity, one has to take a, a very deep dive into esoteric scholarship. And if God were real, the truth of the gospel should be a lot more self-evident. Um, and this is um, sometimes also an objection that um, is raised to my epistemology uh, from other Christians as well. Namely, that my hardline evidentialism implies that Christians cannot be rational in believing the gospel unless they become an academic and invest hundreds of hours in the study of the evidences for Christianity. And since not everyone has the aptitude and access to resources necessary to undertake such deep study, so the objection goes, this cannot be God's normative way of imparting rational confidence to believers that the gospel they have entrusted is indeed true. However, I want to be careful here to draw a distinction between what I call an um, explicit rational warrant and what can be called an implicit or tacit rational warrant for Christian faith. Um, every Christian, I would argue, can have at least an implicit rational warrant for believing that God exists and that he's revealed himself in the Bible. Um, for example, Romans 1.20 teaches that God's attributes are revealed in through natural theology, through creation. Uh, the psalmist also writes that the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his hands um, as handiwork. Now, um, I don't think that scripture is envisioning people having to go and get themselves PhDs in astrophysics or molecular biology or master probability theory to see the hand of God revealed in nature. Um, every time we step outdoors and behold the things that God has made, especially living organisms, we intuit that things have been made for a purpose, even if we couldn't explicitly express why that is the case. Indeed, throughout history, the vast majority of people who have lived have been theists. In fact, uh, even... Um, a biologist as staunchly atheistic as Francis Crick, uh, the co-discoverer with James Watson of the double helical structure of the DNA molecule, said that biologists must constantly keep in mind that what they see was not designed, but rather evolved. Richard Dawkins similarly said at the beginning of The Blind Watchmaker that biology is a study of complicated things that have the appearance of having been designed with a purpose. And Dawkins then spends the remainder of the book trying to argue, in my opinion, unsuccessfully, that this design is not real, but only apparent. So where am I going with all this? So I would argue that discovering evidence for God is not actually that hard. Rather, it's been made artificially hard by bad scholarship and poor standards that insist that the simplest answer cannot actually be the correct answer. And this is um, true, I think, in, in both science and biblical scholarship. Um, a lot of ink has been spilled um, uh, that, that's been spilled on these issues. is ink spent answering really bad arguments that should never have gotten traction to begin with. But because they provide an excuse for unbelief, they have become widely accepted and highly esteemed, even among academics who should know better. Now, um, of course, I grant that Christianity is not immediately obvious in the same sense that theism is. However, since the manifest evidence of design in nature renders it non-obvious that there is nothing to the Christian claim, given the stakes involved, it is, I would argue, incumbent on one to investigate the claims of the gospel for themselves, almost to the same extent that it would be if one were very nearly persuaded of its truth. And I'm convinced that the one who seeks to be fully informed and tries his best to engage objectively and rationally with the evidence will, in the long run, come to find Christianity to be true and well-supported. Now, in regards to the problem of evil, <clears throat> I would grant that the problem of evil cont contributes some evidence for atheism over theism. But I think it's easy to overestimate how potent the evidence for atheism is from the problem of evil. Um, for example, instances of evil in the world are not epistemically independent of each other. They're epistemically dependent. So, for instance, um, if, God has a moral, if we suppose that God has a morally sufficient justification for permitting one instance of suffering in the world, however unexpected, it's um, quite reasonable to suppose that he has a similar morally sufficient justification for permitting a second instance of evil, or a third, and so forth. And so the evidential value of each successive instance of evil in the world actually depreciates. It's a problem of diminishing returns by multiplying examples. You can't just keep multiplying examples indefinitely and expect the case to continue to grow in strength. Um, by contrast, though, with the case for theism and indeed Christianity more particularly, we don't just have lots of examples of the same thing. We have multiple, we have extensive evidence spanning multiple disciplines, multiple kinds of evidence, which all point convergently in the direction of theism and indeed uh, Christianity in particular. There's also the problem of um, evidential entanglement, which is to say that the problem of evil and suffering at its core presupposes as a precondition 
the existence of conscious sentient experience. And this would also apply, of course, to the problem of um, animal suffering. Animal suffering is a problem, I think, both for the theistic view as well as for the naturalistic view, because um, nat there's nothing in naturalism that predicts conscious sentient experience, which is a precondition of suffering. Consciousness, as Richard Swinburne sh has shown, is much more probable, much more likely on the supposition of theism than on the supposition of naturalism. And therefore, evil and suffering is highly unexpected, highly surprising, whether you're a theist or whether you're an atheist. Uh, furthermore, uh, the problem of evil has finite evidential value, as I think Alex would agree. So if a certain ev um, evidential threshold um, uh, in con confirmation of theism is successfully satisfied, that provides an indirect basis for, the, for supposing that God has some morally sufficient justification for the instances of apparently gratuitous suffering in the world, even if that uh, explanation presently eludes us. Um, as for menial suffering that Alex alluded to, um, I would argue that uh, a universe that, um, that um, behaves in a regular and predictable and intelligible way is good, especially in the context of uh, eternity. Uh, intuitively, uh, it's, uh, I would argue, intrinsically good, um, and, uh, and it's, it's good to accentuate the moral arena in which we find ourselves um, from God's perspective. And the, the enterprise of science is good, which supposes um, a regular, pr um, predictable, intelligible um, pattern. Uh, to the to the to the world, um, and so um, it's therefore unclear that there exist possible universes which unfold so elegantly in accordance with scientifically intelligible laws, which do not also result in occasional harm to creatures born into it.